This first poem is called Blink. And it's a recent poem of mine. I wrote while I was actually doing the artwork. And so part of it is a, is a, a narrative of what I was experiencing. But there's an interplay between the actual poet and then a subliminal what I'm thinking. So though you can't see it written, you'll hear one poem that interjected in between the stands are these thought processes. So you have to put it together. So it may seem jumbled, but in all actuality, it actually works together. So this is Blink. I suppose I could spend my whole day looking at you. Though the river is drying and war's rumor, with disease knocking and pestilence abounding, my little flower, orange red with yellow pistols, perched among purple lavender, I breathe and think of lifting my eyes to see this earth passing. But for a moment there is nothing as fair as God's fingerprint pressed upon this field of silence, asking me not to blink. I wrote this while I was watching my older son fish in the Rio Puebla River. And at the same time, my younger boy was just over here. And the bat flew down and was chasing gnats over his head. So it just kind of spawned in me. And I went back to the cabin and I, I kind of wrote this down. So it's called Hole. Sipapu is a word the Tiwa people use for the hole where the first people emerged on earth. I sit by the Rio Pueblo watching the river run. The sun sets over the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. One child, almost a man, fishes, whipping the line in subdued expectation, standing on rocks that hold time. The other child watches a bat dive and dance above his head, seeking gnats that provide the air with life. But once caught, Fish or net, in water or sky, a hole is created that emerges someplace else amidst the blood of Christ. I want to thank uh, the Penwood Review, which is a, uh, a national uh, poetry uh, group. Uh, they published this po poem called The Culture to Itself. And this is actually a real place. When I lived in Modesto, California, I went to a barber shop where Jay and Paul were the barbers. And they were both in their 80s, very lively, energetic 80s. Uh, but Jay was great because he would tell me all these, these stories about being a private investigator and all this. But Paul, later on in the day, because they would get there at 4 in the morning, they would open their shop at 4 in the morning. But if you showed up like 3 in the afternoon, he'd be so tired, he would fall asleep while he was cutting your hair. And so you'd have the clippers, and you felt him just lean up on you, and the clippers going, and Jay would go, Paul, and he'd come back up, and he would start cutting your hair again. So I, I wrote this poem based upon my experience uh, there. It, it, it was just a great place. A culture to itself. Paul will drift away as he stands with hair remnants around. It's amazing to see scissors, comb, and razor, his eyes shut and he leans forward just enough for the head of a voice to act as a pillar for R.E.M. His quiet life and tie somehow intertwine. Jay can cut two to Paul's one. He will converse in a language all his own. He speaks of private investigators and the dead with new hair. I've seen him almost butcher a man. More blood on the razor than a surgery table. Escalon, where Derry was his childhood, sleeps well with him. Together they are a business of being, a history all their own. Many will come and provide appendages to their pages of story. For 350, a bargain of life is dished in a historical array. Pictures hang as sand on the wall. No names, just faces with hours of words. Together we sit. I wonder if Mr. McHenry ever pondered the life that would happen on a street named after him. In a barber shop where teacher and hobo, minister and taxi driver converge to smell the same talk powder and touch the moment where something but silence exists for the day. <laughs>